Insulin resistance is a serious issue. It has been, but now it's becoming increasingly serious because we're seeing more and more people dealing with it. Now, it's not just about individual singular things that you eat. Sometimes it's about what you can combine with a meal. So what I have for you is a really interesting thing that you can add alongside carbohydrates to potentially modulate not just the glucose spike that comes with the carbohydrates, but more importantly, the insulin secretion that comes along with the carbohydrates that you consume. Because insulin resistance is basically just a cumulative buildup of just being bombarded with so much insulin that the cells start to kind of tune it out, like white noise, like a fan. They see it all the time, so they say, forget it, that's just insulin doing its thing. But if you can lessen the amount of insulin that you secrete, then you're less likely that the cells are gonna just tune it out, like a nagging girlfriend or boyfriend, right? So anyhow, let's break this down and what it looks like. The first thing I wanna talk about is adding a chilled potato or a chilled sweet potato alongside your carbohydrates. What? That's kind of wild, right? And it sounds weird, but it's really something that you could do pretty simple. Like, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but you could whip up some cold sweet potatoes or heat them and then whip them up and then add some stevia to them or something and make like a, a nice cold sweet potato dish. But anyway, hear me out on the science. So there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrient, and this was cool because they looked at chilled potato consumption. In this case, it wasn't even necessarily sweet potatoes, and they found that it had a huge impact on not just glucose, but on insulin secretion. Okay, so what they did is they gave subjects 250 grams of boiled potato or 250 grams of potato that was baked and then chilled. What happens when you heat a potato is the starch molecules expand and you now have more saccharides that are available to turn into what's called maltose. So basically you have starch chains that are bound together really tight and then they cleave off when the heat expands. And those individual glucose molecules that did make up a starch chain can now be absorbed really fast. That's why baking a potato spikes your blood glucose so much. But when you put that potato in the fridge overnight or whatever, or a leftover, what happens is those starch chains bind back together, the amylopectin and these other things, they repackage. So they now repackaged back into a little starch chain that the body has a hard time breaking down into individual glucose molecules. It's really cool. It actually has a name. It's called RS3, resistant starch 3, or retrograded starch. So the response on glucose was interesting because what they found is what's called the area under the curve, like the total amount of like insulin expense over a two hour period, was actually the same between the two but how it was separated out and attenuated was really interesting. So the glucose response at 15 minutes post carbohydrate consumption was a modest 5%, 4.8% less. Not huge, nothing to write home about. But at 30 minutes, it was over 9% attenuated. Okay, that's cool. I like a lesser glucose spike, but when they looked at insulin values, that's where it was crazy. Okay, because with the insulin values, at 15 minutes post-consumption, 25% less insulin release. At 30 minutes, 22% less insulin release. So we are turning that stuff down by a quarter. 25% less release of insulin. Now, if you were to do this alongside some other carbohydrates, perhaps you are slowing down the absorption of those carbohydrates too. You see, what's interesting is they found that there was no change in what is called the gastric inhibitory polypeptide response, GIP. Those are when the carbohydrates hit the duodenum, like right after the stomach, that triggers this release saying, oh, there's carbohydrates coming in. So the body recognized that there were carbohydrates the same, like between either group. But what happened is 30 minutes later, when glucagon-like peptide down in the small intestine and in the colon came into the picture more, that's where it was attenuated. What does that mean? What the heck is Thomas talking about? Please put this in English. What that simply means is that the carbohydrates that normally would have been absorbing were hanging out in the gut, fermenting, feeding the gut microbiome. So when they were feeding the gut microbiome, not only are you getting the benefit of them diversifying your microbiome, which is hugely important, you're also getting hmm, this added side effect of them not absorbing. <laughs> so when they don't absorb, guess what? Well, that's gonna make it so that you don't have the insulin spike, you don't have the glucose spike, because you are stopping this overall breakdown. Really cool stuff. 
Not to mention having a more diverse microbiome long term has some correlation with glucose modulation because what happens is these bacteria feed on this fiber and they produce these little weird things called short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids not only feed the lining of our intestines to keep our intestines healthy, but they also act as signals that affect what's called glucose modulation. They affect how a cell uses glucose. That's why I always say, eat your fiber, eat your fiber. People ask about probiotics along with this too, which they play a role. You should eat probiotic rich foods. You should do that kind of stuff. You should eat your fiber. People that like to take probiotics, I put a link down below for pretty much the only probiotic that I would recommend. They're, they appear on this channel a lot. They're a sponsor, they're called Seed. They are what is called a symbiotic. Okay, so they have a prebiotic and a probiotic in one with a capsule inside of a capsule but I'm a science nerd and that's what I'm about. And I just appreciate the fact that they run a lot of their own clinicals. They run a lot of their own studies and they put their money where their mouth is, which counts as something for me because that's the kind of person that I am. Marketers are cool, sure, but people that actually do the work, they're even cooler. So I put a link down below for you to save 15% off if you want to try them out. There's not a game changer for your glucose metabolism, but it's something that if you're making a conscious effort, you may want to consider. So that link is down below to save 15% off using code THOMAS15. Now what's the next thing that you can do? Okay, we know that, okay, yes, you can add some chilled sweet potatoes or some chilled potato, or you know what, if you've ever had a cold potato, it's actually not that bad, it's actually pretty good. You don't have to have this with as your only source of carb, you can have it alongside your other. Think about Thanksgiving, for instance. What if you wanted to have some stuffing, but you wanted to also like modulate the glucose? You had some whipped sweet potatoes that are cold with some cinnamon and some stevia. Okay, doesn't sound too bad to me to save myself some insulin release. But anyway, there was another study that was published in the Journal of Food Processing and Technology. And this looked at, in this case particular, a sweet potato, baking it, microwaving it, or steaming it and how that affected the glucose. Really crazy. They found that when you first take a raw sweet potato, you have about a 0.63% maltose amount. Okay, that means 0.63 available, like quick acting sugar. Yeah, but who's going out and gnawing on a raw sweet potato? When you bake it, that amount increases to 20%, over 20%. When you steam it, that amount increases about 14%. When you microwave it, it only increases 5%. Now I'm not here advocating to microwave everything, but I'm also realistic. And I don't know, maybe some impact from a microwave now and then isn't as bad as constant bombardment of glucose that shouldn't be there, right? So you think about this, why is this happening? When you heat a sweet potato in the oven, you're cooking it for like 20, 30 minutes. Lots of long exposure to high heat has more time to break apart those starch molecules. When you steam it, you still have a long time exposed to heat. The difference is that the steaming can actually pull some of the sugar out with it. So that steam, that heating element itself, interacts with the potato and pulls some of the sugar out with it. That's why it's a little bit less when you steam it or boil it compared to baking it. But what's the deal with microwaving it? Well, microwaving it actually inhibits some of the impact. It inhibits the maltose formation itself through the act of microwaving it but it's also because you're heating a potato in minutes versus 20, 30 minutes. You're heating it in four or five minutes. Less reaction time with the heat means less starch expanding and separating. So take it for what it's worth, but maybe if you're gonna have a sweet potato or a baked potato, you wrap it in a paper towel or something and you microwave it. And that's what we pay attention to. So very, very interesting thing. One more thing to add that doesn't have to do with the potatoes Eat your protein first, because the protein will attenuate the glucose and insulin response by up to 2x by having your protein first. Protein, then you maybe eat your cold sweet potato whip stuff, then you eat your higher carbohydrate heated starches, your indulgence, right? So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out Seed down below, and I'll see you tomorrow.